Logan Fire. And it looks like things are growing in this room with a lot more people here. We're going to follow a similar format as of yesterday. Okay, just got told to hold this closer. So the panel, make sure we hold this close to our mouth. I'm going to do a similar format. We have about four or five speakers. Just give you a brief overview of items, and then we'll bring additional people up here and do a panel with some Q&A with you guys. So please hold your questions to the end. Um, the first, I'm going to introduce uh, Bill Nichols, who is your fire chief with Spokane County Fire District 4. Thanks, Guy. Hey, good morning, folks. A uh, lot bigger crowd here than a couple days ago when I was here. Uh, one thing I want to add to that is uh, there's a lot more responders here as well. Uh, so you guys have probably heard that uh, we've got a national Type 1 incident management team is coming in to uh, take over management of the fire. That's not because uh, the Type 3 team didn't do a good enough job. It's just because they bring a lot more resources and ability to uh, add additional resources to support you folks and what you need. Uh, one thing I want to mention that's critical in my mind is there's a lot of deep roots with this national team. And just because they're national, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're from places far away. We've got uh, a lot of hometown folks on that team, a lot of Spokane County folks on that team. And so the community is still uh, a priority for that team and will still be the major focus for them. So uh, glad to uh, have Dan Quinones, their incident commander, and his folks here to join us in, in this firefight. So uh, I'll be around afterwards for questions and uh, glad to have Dan, you and your folks here. Thank you. With that, there's several changes. Tomorrow, I won't be up here in front of you. Stan, can you raise your hand? He'll be the incoming public information officer, and it will be his, your point of contact and for calling. If you don't remember any number to call and you still call me, that's OK. I'll help you out and get you to the right person. So don't worry about not having the right number, OK? Next is our in instant commander, Andrew Stenbeck. Good morning. So uh, the current situation out, out there, and this will include last night, was um, again, we, we talked about yesterday, these lines here were in pretty good. And uh, so the north side and the west side of the fire seem to be holding, but they haven't been wind tested. I'll get, I'll get to that a little bit later, but we did talk about lines. If you weren't here, are a little indirect, which means we have some unburned material between our lines and where the fire edge is at. So there's still flames in there, there's still stuff burning around and cleaning up. That's why we're at zero containment is because it doesn't, uh, we, don't, we don't have enough confidence to say it's, it's contained yet, but, but we have lines going in there. They did round the corner up here. Um, this starts to be some some rougher terrain, some hilly stuff up in the, the uh, industrial timbered lands, and they're starting to come down this way. The Blanchard Road, they're starting to do work. They got up into these draws here, and they started to push down to the south. So we're starting to get some lines coming this way. That's why you're starting to see these things starting to straight, straighten out a little bit is because straight lines are better lines for us. The more d turns and jags you have on it, the more actual line you have with threat of stuff crossing it. That's why sometimes you see firefighters draw a straight line and then they burn it out is because it's a much safer line. This down here, we talked yesterday when you don't have wind, what becomes the dominant feature that drives the fire? It's your fuels and topography. I heard topography, somebody was listening. So uh, good job. Well, we got into some topography there yesterday afternoon. The fire, the fire picked up down here in the Button Road, Conklin area, and uh, we, we, we were doing some, some pretty strong firefighting. 
our day resources stayed out there until 10 o'clock at night, until things started to settle a little bit. It may not have appeared to have settled because at night the flames look a lot more dramatic, but we, we felt like it was time to pull them off and get them a little rest before they had another long day. And so we did lose a few outbuildings last night, but uh, night ops is reporting that we didn't lose any uh, primary residences, and so that's a good thing. Um, but we did lose a, a few structures. So uh, we, have, we have a pretty heavy effort going down in this country to try and lock down secure lines. You know, yesterday I said we're up to about 400 folks. I think we're closing in on 600 folks today, and that greatly exceeds the capacity of my team. So I'm very glad to see this Northwest Team 1, or National Team 1 coming in. Um, I know a lot of the folks on the team, like Bill was saying, they have local ties. They, they understand a lot of what goes on in, the, in our communities, our communities, right? And, and it's also their communities to a lot of their teams. So um, it was a good draw for us. With that, I would ask for um, you guys to understand, we talked about wind, topography, and fuels. Tomorrow, today's weather, uh, if you're looking at, at the forecast, you'll see that there's some predictions of, of rain, right? The, the tropical storm Hillary uh, moisture is, is caught up in a draft coming up to us. We're likely going to see some rain on this fire, but before you see rain with that type of weather, what are we going to see? All right, you guys are paying attention. Uh, I must have done my job. Uh, so we're going to get a wind test. This, this wind has been mostly northerly and kind of easterly. It's now going to pivot around and become southerly. And, and so when we say southerly, people a lot of times think it's going to push south. It's if you face south, the wind will come to your face. So it's actually going to blow to the north. So these lines here that, that we've said we have, have a line there, but we have some indirect line, are going to get tested some. And um, we'll start to have understand more with what we got out there. That wind, that wind will blow for a while before we probably see any moisture. So we're on, we're on pretty high alert. Today's going to be an important day to our efforts. Um, the team will also have night ops tonight, and then tomorrow at, at 0600 we transition. So um, we'll be here a little while longer, and this team has completely folded in with us, adding to our capacity. We're, we're married and collabor collaborating together. It's a really important thing for us and f for our safety and for your guys' um, safety and our firefighting efforts. So this is probably the last time I'm going to present to you guys. Um, so I appreciate your, your support and your audience. The um, other thing I'd like to recognize is the Riverside School here has been really good hosts. <laughs> you guys are fortunate to have this type of school district here that supports you support the community and support our efforts. So been to a lot of schools and, and they're top notch. So so uh, thank you for your guys' support and efforts and and uh, I'll hand it back to the guy. I won't ramble on too much more. A couple items in your packets of information. One, the evacuations level have not changed. Your map will look different because we resized it because certain areas were cut off. And people were asking about the south and the east side. So we just resized the map to show everything encompassing. So it has not ch actually changed, just we resized the map so it looks different. Um, the other thing is on the back page will be a thing about drones. We do know drones have been flying in the area. And people ask, how do you know? Any idea how I know? <laughs> Facebook posts. So yes, we've seen those Facebook posts, okay? So it's not your neighbor, it's you sharing that with us. Drones flying the air, it means we cannot fly the helicopters or the fixed wing aircraft. So please, no drone flying during this wildfire. Share that with your neighbors, please. 
Uh, next, I want to introduce Under Sheriff Mike Killis Killistad. It's a small world. I grew up across the street from Guy, and now we're up here at a fire scene, so it's kind of a small world. Uh, my name is Mike Kittlestead. I'm the unincorporated patrol uh, division commander. Basically, I have all the county uh, patrol units. Um, I started on the Gray's Fire Friday. We got a watch duty uh, notification that this one was going on, so we came screaming up here with seven or eight of us and started doing evacuations up the north end of this thing. Uh, I've kind of been bouncing back and forth, um, so I got a pretty good handle on both of them and what's going on. Um, just to give you an idea of what's going on with us and anticipating some of your concerns and questions, and I'll be around as well. Uh, Lieutenant Keene is here as well, giving me a hand. So if there's specifics that you need answers for, or something, come and ask. Um, as far as patrol, uh, traffic control goes, we have all the corners blocked to try to reduce the congestion, or reduce the number of people going into the fire because we have a significant footprint now with, now that this fire's been upgraded with the type team. Um, there's gonna be a lot more brush trucks and fire trucks driving around trying to get to places quickly. And the more people that are on the roads, uh, the more problematic it is for them. So please cooperate with those zones as much as possible. Um, we've had very little incidents at those checkpoints. People have been very respectful, uh, both to the deputies, and I, and I hope we've been that in reverse as well. Um, you know, when we come knock on doors when we're moving evacuation zones, that's because we're trying to let you know and we're trying to move on to the next one. The thing about North County is there's a lot of dead-end roads, and deputies are trying to get people out of there because one lodge pole pine across the road, and then everybody's stuck, and it's a bad day. So when they come, if they come and knock on the door for the future, that's what that's about. Another big thing we've been dealing with the last two nights is the threat of uh, theft and burglary. It's very uh, much on our minds, and so we have had uh, both uniform and non-uniform patrol uh, out doing checks and driving a lot of roads, looking for people. We've made a lot of contacts. If people are up in those evacuation zones um, and they're not in a brush truck or a fire truck or an obvious police vehicle, they're gonna be contacted just to make sure um, because the people can't be home and, and sometimes bad guys take advantage of that. So we, we are doing a ton for that. We put in an EOC request and it was uh, authorized to get more staff from across the state. So you're gonna start seeing patrol cars in North County that you've never seen and hopefully we'll never see again. Uh, throughout the state. Uh, we've also have state agencies, uh, Fish and Wildlife, uh, State Patrol has been a huge part of this thing. Uh, Spokane Police Department's been up here and out at Grace Fire, big time helping us out. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of different types of cars out here doing traffic control and doing prowl checks to make sure that uh, people's stuff is left where it should be and not taken uh, out of that area. So um, other than that, uh, you know, this is a, this is a big one. Uh, for Spokane County. Um, we won't ever forget this one, but I think everybody has been working together really well from the fire service and the, and the police and law enforcement side to try and make sure and, and keep it as safe as we can until they can get a handle on it, which they're doing a fantastic job on. So I want to thank you very much. Next is Grant uh, Best with Inland Power to give an update of the work they've been doing out there. Good morning. Uh, just an update from Inland Power. We currently have about 400 members still without power. Um, it's very difficult terrain, uh, unlike uh, some fires we've been on before where it's just poles down the road. A lot of the poles that were, that were burnt and our assets have been destroyed are cross country and very rocky terrain. Uh, the safety of our crews is first and foremost. Uh, they've been in and then how something's flare up so they'll get out of there. And so they're, they're doing everything they can to get the power back up. Uh, we expect the next couple of days to be pretty challenging because our, our resources are split between this fire as well as the Gray's fire. So we have currently all of our crews are working as well as four contract crews. Uh, so you'll see them out there. They're, we're, we've moved now to 16 and eight, so 16 hours of working and then eight hours of rest. It's imperative that these guys are alert. Um, they did the first 32 hours straight, and now they're on 16 and eights. And so you, you most likely will not see crews out in the middle of the night working. It's gonna be mostly during daylight hours. Uh, but please be patient. We're doing everything we can to get power back up um, so our members can get back to life. So any questions, I'll be here uh, after as well. 
Well, if you don't mind, we save it to the final presentation, and then we'll have everyone up here to take those questions. So our, and we're going one more speaker. So it's be a uh, Glenn Lockwood with Red Cross. Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, lots going on, don't need to tell you all that. The shelter is, as you perhaps know, here, um, here in the school, thanks to a great partnership with Riverside School District, and we have arranged for the shelter to have a continuation here long term. Uh, we're gonna be transitioning from the gym to uh, another, uh, another building here. Uh, probably next week, but we are keeping the shelter here and the shelter will be here as long as you, the residents and the victims uh, of this fire need a shelter to be set up. Um, at the same time, we are really encouraging um, everyone, whether you're res residing in the shelter or not, even you know parking lot people, but even people who stop in to register with the Red Cross and stop off at the desk and identify you know, your name and address and phone number. We get people calling and saying, is my brother or sister or aunt, uncle, mom, dad safe? We, we have a full site that we work with and we call it re reunification. And we are dealing with that, but your information is critical to us. If, if they don't wanna hear, we don't know anything about them because that just levels a high level of anxiety with them and you can understand that. So we're trying to, to make that happen. At the same time, we also have the encouragement for you and some of you have lost everything, we know that. But there are two webs there are two 800 numbers, they're easy to remember. One is 1-800-RED-CROSS. Identify yourself as a fire victim of the Oregon fire and get on the list. That'll, that'll get you to a client caseworker they will start meeting with you on financial assistance, both short-term and long-term assistance. And the other one is 1-800-FEMA, F-E-M-A, Federal Emergency Management Agency. And they will start the process of getting you a caseworker and providing financial assistance. It's substantial, I, I don't wanna quote, in, because you're gonna say Glenn said from the Red Cross that I'd get this much and it, it wasn't that much, or it could be more. But the point is, is that those two sites do not compete with each other. So one's gonna say, did you register with FEMA? And the other one's gonna say, did you register with Red Cross? Because they want people to register in both, with both sites. So 1-800-RED-CROSS, 1-800-FEMA. And that'll get you to that type of assistance. Um, you know, if you're, if you're missing people, if, you're, if you don't know where, what's going on, you can contact the Red Cross and indicate you're looking for someone. If, if not, um, then talk to us at the shelter. We'll guide you through that process. Um, we um, have great support. We've had great support from the school staff. Outside caterers have come in, done meals, and so forth. We're trying to meet special dietary needs. So if you have one, talk to us about it. And if we don't have it here, we'll go out and buy it. Um, we're cooperating with the North County Food Pantry. I have a box truck that's headed there right now full of stuff donated. We're trying to s cut off the stuff coming in here to the facility. The school's got to get ready for school next week. And we, we've been occupying some of their classrooms with stuff. And it's good stuff, but it's still stuff. The food pantry is extending their hours and days of operation. And so North County Food Pantry up there on the on North Collins Road um, off the Elk to Highway Road is uh, a great spot. The LDS Church has just um, said that they will take uh, donated items. And uh, I, I wanna tell you it's from nine to 12 and from four to seven, Monday through Saturday. And so that's another location. The food pantry is gonna be jammed. The church does not have any more room Country Church of the Open Bible. They have no more room for any type of donation to come in the door. So if you get into that parking lot, don't stop at the church, keep going to the food pantry and they'll work with you. Uh, the VFW Hall, all open their doors. We fill them up. 
this is the outpouring that we're seeing here in elk and and people are coming from long a long ways off to bring stuff to this to to this uh, disaster and um and we want to make sure that it's made available to everybody who needs the help so come to the food pantry talk to the red cross register online um and did i cover that on the sheriff's department there and and so forth okay um and at I'm not leaving, so when it's Q&A, I'll be able to answer any questions. Okay? Now we're going to ask the, all the speakers to come back up, plus Tim Love. Bill, you're hiding in the back. So we're going to start with, as soon as they get here, with you first. Right, so that's a great question. Uh, right now we're just getting our main feeder lines up and hanging transformers where they're supposed to be. We won't be energizing anything until we communicate with the homeowners and make sure that everything is uh, A-OK -okay to do that because we understand that we can't plug stuff back in. We don't know what's on the other side of the meter and, and et cetera, et cetera, especially when people had to leave so quickly. You know, we don't want to be, um, causing any more damage. So no, we're just getting the lines back up and then we'll be communicating with our members and get them on systematically that way. So. Yeah. 400. Yeah, 400 on this fire. Yeah, um, I don't have that in my brain, but I can get it to you, okay? So I'll keep fixed on you and I'll come get you that number. Hey, you uh, must have been at this meeting yesterday. Uh, <laughs> That's a pretty big topic. Pilot safety is very important to us. And so they will let us know if it's safe for them to fly. Yesterday, we were able to get a helicopter out of Roselia to come up here and fly for a fuel cycle. They weren't able to lift up out of Deer Park. So it's very, it's very localized, contingent on what they'll do. When they went back and fueled up, it smoked in and they weren't able to get back up. Uh, so it, it's it's day to day. Um, we think with this uh, shift of wind, the air might clean up and we check hourly on the availability of aircraft and if they feel like they can get up and fly. So even if they can get up, they may get here and the visibility won't be such that it's safe for them to do uh, airdrops and that kind of stuff. So we need we need it safe where they're coming from and we need it safe here on the fire where they're doing the work. So um, it's, it's been a struggle uh, the, just due to wind direction and major fires in both the United States and Canada. It's, it's, it makes a big difference. It's a pretty critical resource to, to our work. It hasn't stopped us from doing a lot of good work but it, it will certainly uh, help us move forward. I discussed yesterday, there is a little bit of a blessing and a curse that comes with the smoke. Um, yeah, we can't fly air, but it shades the fire. And with the, the shade, the fire, it, it, it'll reduce the fire behavior. The fire didn't pick up till late in the day, and I believe that was a product of being smoked in. So we're still able to do a lot of good work, even without the air. But if we have the clear air, being able to have that resource is really important just because of the changing fire environment.
I don't really have as much to, that I can comment on the cell towers. I mean, if, if power to the cell tower is down, then that will, of course, affect it. I am not aware uh, if uh, cell towers are down as a result of inlands on inlands lines, but I don't know if you guys have any other information on the cell towers. I think uh, that's good information. We'll put that down because uh, Verizon has reached out to us about anything they can do to help. Um, I'm sure the, other, the others are as well. Sometimes it's when a ton of people come to an area like this that weren't here before, it starts saturating uh, cell towers. Uh, we've seen that at other uh, mass incidents, so. That, okay. Yeah, we'll take a note of it. We can, we can certainly work with the team and see what's going on. This is uh, this fire's ten thousand plus acres, and I guess the way that they'd be able to verify is going into the fire. And right now, it's unsafe to go in there with uh, all the activities going on, and not to mention just the hazards of of uh, trees falling over and power lines down and that kind of kind of stuff. We want to help people get that information as quickly as possible. That's Im very important to our team and to the incoming team. Uh, we want to restore uh, whatever norm normalcy you can have to the community as soon as possible. But right now we're very much in the throes of uh, just trying to stop the fire before we're going to be able to, to dive into the, the safety of getting citizens back into their house. Just a second. Bill wants to comment on that too. Not the south perimeter piece, but I, I did just want to mention that is uh, from the fire department's perspective and uh, what we've been talking with with uh, Dan's folks is, is how do we get out there and best assess how many homes, structures, and that have been lost. Um, you folks all know we've had a significant impact in all this country to our east. So. It's one of the first priorities we have, at least from the fire department's perspective, is to get out there and try to secure that number as soon as we can, as best as we can. Uh, we've got uh, folks tied in with, with Dan's operational folks to start that process in the next day or so. We just need maps and all that to, to verify versus giving you folks incorrect information. So it's a number one uh, concern of ours, and we're working on it. The next question is about the south edge of the fire. The, the, the south edge was the most active part of it. Um, in areas like Button Road and uh, Conklin and Deer Creek, uh, the exact fire perimeter is a little different than what's up here, but this is probably your best to come up after we're done talking and take, take a look at that map or the map that is in the handout uh, might help. Oh, that's the emergency uh, level uh, closure. So if you come up afterwards, we'll do our best to try and give you an idea where it's at if you have a specific area. But um, for, for now, it's, it's kind of down in those canyons along uh, Deer Creek. It's not to Tallman. It's not into that next drainage over. So um, it's, it's hung up in that area that we're, we're actively fighting fire. Joanne Boggs is, go ahead. Okay. 
I had a conversation with Joanne Boggs in the middle of the afternoon. She's the emergency uh, manager for Pondray County discussing this issue. And uh, we're, we're working to resolve it. Um, hopefully the information has gotten better since then. Uh, we're, we're doing everything we can on our side to provide good information there. Um, and she has our contacts. So uh, if you're taught, if you, if you want our best information, you, you might want to be taking a look at the um, Spokane Fire District 4 website for stuff just south. And I know I've seen a map of the Ponderé side, um, but I'm not sure how uh, Ponderé County is disseminating that information. There is an evacuation map for Pondre County. I've, I've seen it. It was created the first night. And um, jo I think Joanne had that. But um, you might want to double back and check today and see, see how she's doing. I just want to make one thing clear to uh, your fire chief from South Pondre County is heavily engaged in the fire. He's been running all the night operations. So we're talking hand in hand with Chief Martin from our, our fire district. Uh, I know everybody's talked about the Watch Duty app. I don't know if you have that, but I know it's got a link to the Ponderay County evacuation map as well. My hunch is why you're not seeing what Ponderay County's evacuation map is, is because the one that's been posted is posted through Spokane County DEM. Why they're not sharing information, I don't have a good answer for you. but. If you can look on that Watch Duty app, I think their map is linked there, and I'm sure from their website you can find it as well. The Pondery County evacuation map is in your packet. They drew it different than Spokane County. They drew the roads, and if you're on the roads, those are the roads that you should be evacuating from. So you can kind of draw a circle. They didn't draw a polygon like Spokane County. They just drew the individual roads up there that were under the level three or the level one evacuation. Next question, please. Uh, Tim Love, I'm with Washington DNR. So I have the uh, Northeast region, which includes the Arcadia district. Um, there is a lot of rumors of that going around. Um, we have not been able to substantiate that. Um, so again, it's rumors. So we are, we've got our senior investigators working with that, tied in with our law enforcement as well as local law enforcement. And um, as you know, the city of Spokane had a pretty high profile arrest last week of, of an arsonist that we believe was responsible and, and admitted to responsibility for, for several of those fires. So I believe that that's a big part of it. The, the events that happened on Friday the 18th we're not connected to arson, I can tell you that. They are under investigation, I can't go into any more detail, but um, they are, there's no pattern, that they're definitely singular events, and we, but we are tracking that very closely and working with law enforcement where we can. So um, some of that is, is just gonna be unknown for a bit, but we don't see any patterns that would lead us to be able to definitively say to the public, be on the lookout, this is what we're doing. On that too, just as I was walking up here, a gentleman came up and said, hey, uh, there's information on a Facebook page that someone's driving around in a black car lighting fires. Facebook isn't the place to report crimes to have the police come and respond, okay? You gotta call 911 if you think there's a crime in progress. Putting it on the Facebook page for the neighborhood, we don't monitor all those. We don't even have access to all of them. So we, we definitely need, if, if there's a legitimate or even a reasonable belief that someone's out doing that, we need to know, and that's 911. So, do you have a follow up? Okay, so someone might have called 911 like they're supposed to, and we went out and looked for them. Um, I have not heard that we've caught any arsonists uh, related to this fire. So. So when the evacuation zones, the way this works is fire, correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a long couple of days, 
fire sets the evacuation zones, and they say there's level level one, level two, level three. When it goes to level three, and like it did on Friday afternoon, and by the way, we did go up in Pondray County, my deputies, I sent them up into Pondray along the chain lakes, because I knew Pondray County doesn't have as many people as we do, the deputies, and then we ended up meeting up and coordinating up at that fire CP. So it doesn't matter if there's a line there, it's an imaginary line as far as I'm concerned, chain lakes, you know, so we went up there on Friday. But for this, if the deputies come and knock on the door, we strongly recommend that there's a reason it's a level three. The wind's kicking up, it's coming this way. We're doing everything we can. We're not gonna arrest someone and throw them in the back of the car to take them. We gotta go to the next house. And if people wanna stay there, that's, you know, that it's highly not advisable. There's a reason these, these gentlemen, these women know their jobs very well and know what this fire can do. And I can tell you, having been in the middle of this one and the Gray's one, it's frightening and, and you think you can defend it, it, it it's, you know, everybody has to make their own decisions, right? But it's highly advisable to leave. Okay. 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 So if it is in the level three zone, we're not letting people in there. It is level three. Yeah, if, that, if that's the, the map that's been drawn, that's what we are doing traffic control there. Keep in mind, some of those roads where the fire isn't is the access road to get where the fire is. And so, okay.